right, P. McCulligan, uh, Exercise Science 281, that's Applied Kinesiology. Um, this is Understanding Strength Part 3. This is where we tie it in and kind of bring it together. Um, hopefully, you're developing an understanding of how to uh, train the body. And, you know, one thing that's kind of fun to do, either for yourself or with clients, is, you know, every three months, do a different type of strength. Train explosively for three months. Doing medicine ball throws and barbell and kettlebell lifts. Train just body weight. Do an endurance strength for three months. Train for max strength for three months. Um, you know, I would always do that with clients, or I do that with clients when, um, you know, and I tell them that and say, I'm giving you a workout program for a year. I'm not just giving you a workout for a day in the gym, but here's how, here, but based on what you tell me you want to do, here's how I see us working. You do two to three months of, you know, um, max strength. You do two to three months of base strength, two to three months of strongman training, two, you know, however, whatever is relevant to the goal. And on that note, um, please keep in mind that um, nobody, no, no exercise fitness um, professional should give an answer without saying the word that depends. Um, I cannot give you, I cannot tell you the best exercise for you unless I know the goal. What's your training goal? What's your experience? What's your skill level? Any injury history? You know, what's your, you know, there are a number of variables I need to understand before I can say, hey, you should be doing this workout. So keep in mind that there's always that caveat is anybody you listen to as an exercise professional would be completely irresponsible to, to say, oh yeah, one size fits all. Instead, what you would do want to say is, um, what you do want to say is that, uh, you, you know, you say given certain variables, this is exactly what we want to do or how we want to do it. So you want to, you know, tie that in and saying, I don't know what you want, but hey, here's, you know, here's how we can tweak it um, and make it work together. So keep that in mind. When I talk about this stuff, it's in general purposes. Every, everybody is different. Everybody is different. We understand from the research how the body may adapt to certain exercise protocols, but not every person will adapt the same way for a variety of reasons. You know, So um, keep in mind that every exercise is relative to the skill level and experience of the individual performing it. So last uh, type of strength is absolute strength. Total amount of weight that can be lifted regardless of body weight. You know, Relative strength is the amount to your body weight. You know, max strength or absolute strength is just the amount of weight that can be lifted regardless of body weight. That's generally where we get one RM. You know, that's your absolute total strength. So back, um, general adaptation syndrome, if I'm repeating it, it must be important. Um, the initial time period, shock phase is two to three weeks. Your body's gonna be much more sore. Um, your adaptation phase is uh, anywhere from eight to 12 weeks. And then again, your body you know, adapts to it. So um, that's why it's important to, to continue, not continue, so you don't wanna give people different workouts every day. Um, and I want to stress that because exercise is movement and movement is a skill. So you want to be consistent with your exercise selection. You want to be consistent with your exercise selection, but change the variables. In order to keep people from hitting exhaustion and reaching a plateau, change the variables. You can change the amount of intensity. You can change the reps. You can change the uh, rest interval. You can change, change the number of sets. But keep the movements relatively consistent so that, an individual, so that your clients develop reflexive strength. Um, that's really what we're trying to train. We want people to use their body without thinking about it. You know, if we're constantly changing exercises, constantly changing movements, you don't have time to, to learn and get skilled at a movement pattern. You know, especially for a technical lift like the clean and jerk. The clean and jerk is a very technical lift. If you only do that once every couple of weeks, you're not going to develop an efficient skill in the pattern. So you need to be very consistent with using certain um, with using certain movements. So the body becomes much more um, efficient at producing them. Um, organizing the sets, you know, it depends on whether your goal is mechanical or metabolic. Another thing to consider is are you developing a skill? Meaning are you improving their ability to do a certain amount of work or a certain type of work? Or are you working on conditioning, which is work capacity? Um, so these are different ways to organize the sets. Um, you can do circuit training, which is alternating muscle groups or movement patterns. You do an exercise for certain either repetitions or for time. Um, and then you, you alternate. So you do maybe you do an upper body push followed by a single leg movement for the for the lower body, followed by an upper body pull, followed by a lateral, um, sorry, bilateral um, two legged squat movement. And so that way, as your upper body is working, your lower body is resting. As your lower body is working, your upper body is resting. The next way to organize sets, and this is actually coming to us from the CrossFit world, this is one that absolutely, um, I, I think, you know, I've, I, there are a lot of opinions out there about, the, um, about CrossFit anything else here's the thing if you do it wrong it's going to hurt you bottom line any type of exercise walking if you do it wrong it's going to hurt you 
Um, you know, yoga, do it wrong, it's going to hurt you. CrossFit's no different. Um, if you do it two or three times a week and you have good movement skill and you get loud recovery, it's going to serve you very well. If you do it too frequently and don't allow yourself to recover, you might run into problems. So anyway, CrossFit, to get back to AMRAP, AMRAP can stand for as many reps as possible or as many rounds as possible. If I'm giving you, you know, as many reps as I want you to do as many reps as you can in 30 seconds. Now, as many rounds as say I give you, um, to go back to that example, I give you push-up, I give you single leg, I give you lunges, I give you pull-ups, and I give you, um, I give you chin-up. So you have four different movements. I want you to do eight reps of each. Um, and I want you to do that as many times as you can in 10 minutes. That's a way to make it a very, uh, make, make a, uh, a relatively simple workout very hard. So if I challenge you to do those four movements for eight to 10 reps each, I want to see how many times you can do that in 10 minutes. Assigning your fitness is maybe the first time you do it, you can do it six times in 10 minutes. Then maybe as you get better, you can do it seven or eight times. That's going to be a way to, to measure improvement. Complex training is um, PAP stands for post activation um, potentiation. Yeah, post activation um, potentiation, PAP. And what you're doing with the complex is you're doing a strength exercise followed by a power exercise. So in this example, maybe you're doing a, a deadlift. A deadlift is a heavy hip hinge, and maybe you're doing a, a really heavy deadlift, 350, 400 pounds for two to three reps. You want to rest. Um, the research varies. Rest intervals can be anywhere from one to four minutes. And then after the strength exercise, uh, since deadlift is a hip dominant, hip hinge movement, then maybe you want to do explosive kettlebell swings. And what you're doing when you do a strength exercise is you're activating more muscle motor units. And when you do a power exercise following it, you activate the speed at which the motor units work. Now here's the thing, there's been some actually pretty interesting research with sprinters doing a heavy set of three to five squats and then sprinting. And what they're finding is that can be a way to uh, help increase sprint time. So if you're sprinting, you can do an 11 second, 100 meter, um, you know, 100 meter dash. Maybe you start doing uh, one uh, set of heavy squats um, for five reps before you run. You might be able to drop, you know, quarter second off that, which quarter second can be the difference between third and first. Um, so, you know, look up complex training if you have any questions. Supersetting, um, supersets are back to back exercises for competing muscle groups, bicep curls followed by tricep extensions. Um, you're doing push, uh, push ups followed by chin ups. You're doing a, um, you know, hamstring dominant exercise like a hip hinge followed by a quad dominant exercise like a squat. Um, so you really, you know, you kind of, you know, how, however you structure it works, but you generally want to use opposing or competing muscle groups. Compound um, sets are back-to-back -back sets for the same muscle group. That might be a chest press followed by push-ups. That might be a uh, pull-up, a uh, number of pull-ups followed by bent over rows, but you're doing two exercises back-to-back -back for the same groups. Tri-sets are three exercises in a row, and you're moving from compound. So a tri-set might be, I'm going to do barbell squats. Then I'm going to do lunges, um, eight squats uh, with eight RM. Then I'm going to do eight lunges on each leg. And then I might do hamstring curls or quadriceps, like leg extensions or leg curls, depending on what movement or what muscle I want to do, work. Drop sets, um, drop sets are awesome because you're doing both mechanical and metabolic overload. That's why bodybuilders use them, because they work. Um, and a drop set is you use a weight, say you start with 100 pounds, um, for bicep curls on a cable machine, you, you push as many, you maybe get four or five bicep curls, you drop the weight, you drop 10, 20 pounds, you do as many as you can, drop 10, 20 pounds, do as many as you can, and keep going until you can't lift your arms anymore. You want to talk about a rapid way to growth, that's one way to do it. However, keep in mind when you do that kind of high volume um, mechanical metabolic overload, you're going to create muscle soreness. Um, so you have to be able to make sure that you have recovery time, an appropriate recovery time, and that you're not going to debilitate yourself by being too sore. Um, another one, this comes from a friend of mine named Derek Price. I'm sure other people have done this too, um, is completing a certain number of reps in a training session. Maybe I take, um, maybe I, I take uh, six exercises, 10 reps each. You know, so if we do a you know, body weight squat followed by a push-up, followed by a chin-up, followed by a lunge, followed by a bent over row, followed by um, maybe chops, Six exercises, 10 reps each. One time through, that's 60 reps. We do that five times, we hit 300 repetitions. If you make that a goal for your client, say, hey, today in this workout, I want you to do 300 repetitions. Today in this workout, I want you to do 500 repetitions. You know, it's a way to make it more interesting. It just changes, you know, changes the approach. It's, you know, it's not, 
the end all be all, but change the approach. One thing that's relatively, it's not new, but I'm still playing with it and I don't have it up here, is something called EMOM, E-M-O-M. Every minute stands for every minute on the minute. So maybe I'm gonna do 10 kettlebell swings followed by 10 push-ups, and then I you know, have a running timer. So every time I hit a minute, 10 swings, 10 push-ups, then I rest for the rest of the minute. So it might take me you know, six, seven seconds to do 10 swings, might maybe take me 12 to um, 15 seconds to do 10 push-ups, and then I rest for 35 seconds, whatever the remainder is, and boom, I go. Imam um, are, is a great way. If you don't have much time, want to work in a lot of, uh, lot of uh, work in a short period of time, Imam can be a way to go. That's very, uh, a very good um, reference or resource for when clients get busy. So here are different types of equipment. And you know what I don't have on here are suspension trainers. Um, you know, the lower left, that's uh, my, my car. Um, you know, a few years ago, again, taking a uh, coach high school rugby, and I was taking that to a conditioning practice for my rugby players. Um, you have medicine balls, sandbags, vipers, heavy ropes, kettlebells. It just depends on, on what, you know, I, I generally set up circuits and pretty high intensity conditioning circuits. Dumbbells, um, machine weights, barbells. Again, if you train on dumbbells for 10 weeks, what should you do? Train with something else, barbells. You can do the same exercises. Um, just you know, change the amount, type of resistance. So these are all different types of equipment. You can also use elastic resistance, um, you know, sandbag. You can be very creative. Body weight is always an option. Um, another one of my personal favorites, you know, basically my three favorite things on here are um, the Viper, which is that plastic rubber, th not plastic, that rubber thing. It's in the picture on the lower left. You see the, those two black tubes. Those are rubber tubes, one's 16 kilograms, one's 20 kilograms. Um, if you don't know what, it, you know what that is in pounds, look it up. Um, uh, but you know, they, they you allow you to move weight. Those are for developing agile strength. Um, kettlebells, I would be happy to train. If all I ever train with the rest of my life, Vipers, kettlebells, and that cable machine in the lower right-hand corner, that's all you really need to almost do anything you'd wanna do in exercise. Maybe not the best for isolation training, but I ain't walking on my stage in underwear anytime soon, so that's not really an interest of mine. You always have to decide the best equipment for your client based on their goals and their experience. Coming to that, um, next slide is appropriate progressions. On the left, we have a 16-year-old kid. A 16-year-old kid might get his driver's license, but a 16-year-old kid in no way, shape, or form should be driving a Porsche Carrera GT. A Porsche, um, that Porsche can go zero to 60, four seconds. Um, 16 year old kid who's been driving two weeks is gonna kill himself. Um, so appropriate progressions. You hear me talking about different types of strength training. That is not where we start, that is where we work up to. So that's why you know when I worked at the American Council on Exercise, I helped develop that integrated fitness training model. You know The initial phases are stability, mobility, and then movement um, pattern training. That's because you're learning um, your body's, uh, you know, um, stability, mobility, and, you know, and movement training, your body's learning how to move. So we need to teach people how to move more effectively first before we start loading them up. So it'd be irresponsible of any trainer to take a new client and start having to try to work the hardest they can. It's going to take a period of anywhere from two to six months in order for a client to become appropriately fit to start doing more advanced exercises. So really respect that. Don't try to challenge clients to do something beyond their skill level or beyond their work capacity. That is a sure recipe for um, creating injury. So you really um, want to make sure that uh, you really want to make sure that you don't have any uh, any questions with that. And it, it's better to go slower. I always I would much prefer to have a client come to me and say, you know what, I think I can work a little harder. That to me is much more preferable than somebody texting me the next day and saying I can't get out of bed because my legs are so sore. Um, I've had people do that as well. You, you think you think they can handle it, they can't. Um, and you're really going to jack them up and create a lot of tissue fatigue and tissue overload. Um, training strategies. This is um, from uh, Stuart McGill's book. Basically, you want to create stability in all possible conditions. That's inherent, and that's from that you know the, the whole idea of um, training on your feet and training dynamically, like with medicine balls and cable machines, is you want to be able to achieve stability in all conditions and all patterns. You want to use a variety of tasks and exercises. Uh, what I said earlier is fundamentally true. You want to stay consistent with the exercise and the movement patterns, but you want to have some variety. Maybe one, one phase you're doing barbell. Maybe next phase you're doing dumbbell. You're keeping the pattern. Movement pattern is relatively um, consistent, but by changing up the, the type of load, you're creating some variability. The body wants variability. If we do the same thing over and over and over again, A, we stop adapting. We stop making gains. B, um, we um, significantly increase the risk 
of tissue fatigue or um, creating an injury. So we uh, co-contraction of muscles creates stiffness. Um, that's why doing integrated movement, squat, lunge, push, pull, rotation is more preferable because you're training the body how to develop stiffness itself. If you have an injury, it's going to disturb a motor pattern. And it's going to create instability. So respect that. Client comes in and says, I don't know what I did to my back this weekend, but it's sore. By all means, work. You know, try not to work through it. Work around it. Maybe go from doing weights to doing body weight. Maybe from um, doing strength exercises to stretching and mobility exercises. But if, if you're injured or client's injured, respect that. It could create a worse injury. Avoid prolonged sitting. If we sit too long, we compress the spine, we compress the sacroiliac joint, um, we allow tightness to achieve, you know, we get tightness in our hips. So that's why we want clients to get up and moving. Another thing, uh, prolonged sitting can uh, limit the amount of uh, lipoprotein lipase. LPL is a enzyme which helps convert fat into energy. And there's some pretty interesting research showing that the longer you sit, um, the lower your levels of LPL, so your body becomes less efficient at burning fat. Now that's also um, a reason why uh, being sedentary for too long is a very dangerous uh, risk. You can really create risk of injury. Um, so you wanna maintain, make sure you pay attention to that. Uh, spine must be able to achieve sufficient stability to handle, um, move, you know, handle resistance in all three planes. That's sometimes why uh, free weight training is preferable to machine training. Machine creates a false environment. You're sitting in a bench, you're pushing against the lever. Um, that's good for a certain phase. Again, that, that's, you, it can be good. It's not a bad thing in general, but you're not putting as much stress into the body as possible. Um, what you want to do is try to use the nervous system to activate as much muscle tissue. And um, remember, I've said this many times before, that we burn five calories of energy to use um, one liter of oxygen. If you're doing isolated training, you're only using a finite or very limited amount of muscle tissue, so your oxygen consumption is down. If you're doing integrated movement pattern training, we're using multiple movements and multiple muscle groups at the same time, oxygen consumption goes up, and energy expenditure goes up. Free rates versus machines. I'm not going to read these to you. Um, for certain people, machines provide a lot of benefits. I think for older adults, if you want, older adults should be strength training. You know, and there's some really interesting research suggesting that heavy strength training for older adults provides some significant benefits. Muscle strength, which reduces sarcopenia. Sarcopenia is a loss of uh, bone, or sorry, sarcopenia is a loss of muscle uh, tissue, or not muscle tissue, but atrophy of muscle tissue. You don't lose muscle, just atrophies, and it becomes less effective. Sarcopenia is atrophy of muscle, and that happens um, during aging. So if, if you're working with an older client, machine training is completely appropriate for the first phase of their program because it's going to help them get stronger without you know putting them at risk of trying to do a more advanced movement than they're prepared for. Free weights, you know, great you know, benefit there. Um, just make sure people have the coordination. Uh, some people simply are just are not coordinated. So those folks are much better off being in a machine to get the strength benefits. Anabolic steroids, I already talked about these. Um, one of the benefits of strength training is it produces the anabolic steroids, um, what you see here, which help build and repair muscle tissue. Um, you know, this is an older bit of research by a guy named Brad Schoenfeld. Uh, hey, Brad, if you're listening to this, um, he wrote a book that came out in the summer of 15 called Hypertrophy, no, summer of 16. Sorry, it came out this summer, uh, summer of 2016, called Hypertrophy. Phenomenal book. I absolutely love it. Very geeky, um, very detail-oriented, but uh, OMG, it has so much information in there about how the body responds to training. You know, basically, that book is the embodiment of Brad's PhD work. So you see here on um, what, you know, what happens when you train, um, you do heavy strength training, you're influencing the hormones which is what can help influence muscle growth. Um, influence in the endocrine system, we see here, um, those are the ways you can increase testosterone, relatively short rest intervals, large muscle group exercises. You can see there the ways to influence uh, growth hormone, higher lactate concentrations, um, you know, about 10 RM, moderate volume, shorter you know, one minute rest intervals, and doing some kind of um, offloading, meaning you take a week or two off every eight to 10 weeks, you know, when you're training, changing uh, different types of strength, it's a good idea to take a couple days off. Just let your body rest before you start putting uh, more physiological stress on it. Uh, another research review. Um, sorry, kick back, hit the wrong button. Uh, Three-day split. So when we first started, you know, a lot of us started with bodybuilding. You know, we think of a split as being chest and back on one day, arms and shoulders on another day, you know, calves and abs and, you know, quads and hand, with, with body part splits. You know, you're working isolated muscles. Not, not wrong, just limiting. Um, but I, I look at these splits as one day doing force production, 
So whatever type of strength you want to train, you want to do max strength, you do it on one day. The next day you do body weight training. That's your active recovery day. So if you did a really heavy day to fatigue on day one, on Monday, day two, maybe you do a yoga class, maybe you do Pilates, maybe you do bar, um, maybe you do some kind of body weight training on a TRX. But what you're doing is you're not put, putting um, external resistance on the system. You're teaching the system how to move more efficiently. Um, next one down is energy system. So day three, are you doing uh, which energy pathway are you using? Are you using anaer uh, anaerobic glycolysis? Are you using ATP CP, the, the immediate phosphagen system? Or are you doing a mitochondrial uh, respiration, the long term aerobic system? So uh, you're doing intervals. You can do aerobic intervals where you work uh, right at VT1. And then you recover. Um, you can do anaerobic intervals. You can do steady state training. But this sets up your week. You know, day one, force production, strength training. Day two, body weight training, some type of body weight movement. Day three, energy system, cycling class, running, swimming, whatever you want to do. Use be energy system specific. Day four, um, some type of active recovery or take a rest day, and boom, start over again. Um, so it just gives you a way to organize the sets. It's not again. Keep in mind. I know, I know this is up on YouTube for public consumption. This is for a class I'm teaching. Keep in mind uh, that everything is relative. Everything, any type of strength training program depends on who the individual is, what their training goals are, what their exercise experience is, what injury history, if any, they may have, what equipment is available. There are so many things that it's hard to give. You know, in a lecture, online lecture in 15 minutes, I can't uh, provide a significant deep dive overview. Um, you know, Betty White, you know, 90 year old woman is going to train much differently than The Rock. You know, Dwayne Johnson is 44. He's going to train differently than Dak Prescott, who is a 22 year old quarterback. You know, they're all going to train differently. So it's going to be, you know, because they do different things and use their bodies a different way. So keep that in mind. There is no 100% right way to train. But whatever you do, whether you're a trainer, whether you're an individual, Make sure you change the training program up on a consistent basis. Anyway, this is it for this series of um, understanding strength exercises. Uh, thanks very much for joining me. Uh, my name is Pete McCall. Uh, my website is PeteMcCallFitness.com. Um, you can find out more information there, more blogs. I write for the American Council on Exercise, acefitness.org. You can see some of this information on there. Um, anyway, thank you very much for joining me, and uh, have a great day.